This evening's like oh there we go. <laughs> this evening's lecture is entitled Global Political Challenges: Women Advancing Democracy. I can think of no one better qualified to speak on this topic. After her lecture, Dr. Albright is willing to answer a few questions, and the event will then conclude at 8 p.m. Dr. Albright, thank you very much for coming to the LSE to share your views on women advancing democracy with us. Professor Smith, thank you very much for your introduction and thank you for telling everybody who I am because sometimes people don't know. Uh, I, uh, not long ago, was coming back from China and Chicago was the first port of entry in the United States and I was there getting undressed for the security people and uh, I, I put my stuff down on the conveyor belt ahead of me and um, the uh, lady ahead of me said, so where'd you get all those screw top bottles? My bottles all leak. And I said, well, I got them at the container store. And then I was going through the magnetometer, and the TSA guard looked at me and said, oh, my God, it's you. <laughs> I said, I'm from Bosnia, and we all love you in Bosnia. And if it weren't for you, there wouldn't be a Bosnia, and you're always welcome in Bosnia. And can I have my picture taken with you? And I said, sure. So he stops the whole line against the other TSA agents, and um, it kind of slows things down. So I go and get my stuff. And the lady of the screw top bottle says, so what exactly happened here? And I said, well, I used to be Secretary of State. And she said, of Bosnia? So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I am very happy to be here, and very happy to be here with President Bottomley, who is a good friend and uh, has really shown the most amazing leadership at the finest college uh, in the new world. Uh, as well. um, I am um, also delighted uh, to be here at the London School of Economics again, and I thank you for your hospitality, and, and I thank you all for coming. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people and so many friends. Um, whenever I come to this city, I am reminded of the years that I spent here during the Second World War even though at the time um, I was too young to remember more than bits and pieces. Those slivers of memory are particularly fresh now that I am writing a book about my family's experiences in England and my native Czechoslovakia. I was barely old enough to walk when the Nazis marched into Prague and we came to this country where my father served as head of broadcasting for the Czechoslovak government in exile over BBC. His office was near Marble Arch, and my family lived in an apartment on Kensington Park Road in Notting Hill Gate, before it was fancy. Uh, <laughs> during the blitz, when the air raid sirens sounded, we hurried down to the basement to sing songs, drink tea, and wait for the danger to pass. One evening, a bomb landed outside our building, but failed to explode. And the army came and examined it, but told us not to worry. It seemed that the explosive had actually been built in occupied Czechoslovakia, and the workers there had rigged it so it would not cause any harm. They even put a note in the bomb promising to sabotage everyone that they could. Another day, my father and a colleague decided to ignore the sirens and continue working in our apartment, which was on the third floor. The bombs fell particularly close that morning, shaking the building and throwing my father under a table. When he got up, he smiled in relief and continued to work. Then the next bomb hit, and much to our relief, he and his friend came scrambling down the stairs. Throughout that period, my parents did everything possible to make our lives seem normal, and it was, after all, the only reality that I ever knew. But in truth, the outlook at the time of the Blitz was almost unbelievably bleak. The fascists controlled Europe from Scandinavia to the Mediterranean. The Russians had a deal with Hitler to carve up Poland and parts of the Balkans, and the Americans had not yet entered the war. And the Nazi military seemed unstoppable, so too their ideology of racism and hate. I mention this history because of the role that it played in my own life, but also 
because of the courage and inspiration that it should provide. In the end, the British were not destroyed by the Blitz. They were emboldened by it. Hitler had expected them to show the white flag. Instead, they sent plane after plane into the sky, shooting down so many enemy aircraft that momentum in the war began to shift, and the myth of Nazi power was punctured. Soon, the Western alliance came together, and after years of bitter fighting, the war that had seemed lost a lost cause actually was won. Here in London today, there are no enemy bombers flying overhead and no menacing Hitler across the channel. Yet still, I think we feel ourselves surrounded by a sea of troubles, albeit of a different kind. European leaders portray the current financial crisis as the gravest threat to the continent in 60 years. Students worry about the job market and what it will be like in 10 years to come. We're concerned as well about the perils of violent extremism, the spread of nuclear and other advanced weapons, the potential for disastrous regional conflicts, the looming specter of global warming, the widening divide between the rich and the poor, and the fact that many political leaders, whether in public office or merely competing for the honor, seem at least as confused as any of us. It's little wonder that we are tempted at times to crawl into bed and pull up the sheets and think about everything except what is taking place in the outside world. I have to admit that I've had such thought myself, but then I remember what it was like to be in a bomb shelter and ask, what would have happened if my parents' generation had done nothing more than pull up the sheets? What kind of a world would we have now if they had not taken on the responsibility of fighting back? Obviously, much has changed since that era, and I'm not asking anyone in this audience to become a fighter pilot or to operate an anti-aircraft gun. The times are different, and so are the challenges, but the need for courage has not changed, and neither has the value of public involvement. And in the 21st century, that summons must be extended as fully to women as to men. Back when I was in college, which was sometime between the discovery of fire and the invention of the Blackberry, uh, uh, women were not encouraged to have professional aspirations. And I loved my years at Wellesley and received the best education. But there as elsewhere, young women were being groomed more mostly for marriage. And our graduation speaker, who was the Secretary of Defense, actually uh, thought that our duties were to raise interesting sons. Uh, we were told that uh, our sole and highest duty was to be fascinating wives and raise smart children. In truth, our attitudes were somewhat schizophrenic. We were still part of the silent generation and conditioned to accept the leadership role of men. But we were also in the process of transition. More and more, we would resent being patronized. Increasingly, we thought about having careers of our own, and without question, we wanted to be judged as individuals, not as reflections or appendages of somebody else. As evidence of this, I was, by the standards of our era, a rebel. I was determined to find a good job to further my interest in journalism and so refused to follow the example of my classmates who got married on the same day they graduated. Instead, I waited for a whole three days. <laughs> and contrary to my hopes, it was not until I turned 39 that I was hired for my first professional position. Even then, I never considered the possibility that I might one day become Secretary of State. It's not that I lacked ambition, it's just that I'd never seen a Secretary of State in a skirt. I will not forget actually being sworn into that job and walking for the first time into my new office. And to get there, I had to go down a long hallway lined with portraits of my predecessor, uh, all of whom were men and were only distinguished from each other as to whether they were clean shaven or had beards. And I thought to myself, well, maybe when my portrait goes up, the walls will shake a bit. And they did. Um, it's amazing what has changed in the last 14 years. My granddaughter, when she turned seven a couple of years ago, said, so what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? Only girls are Secretary of State. <laughs> in 
fact, two-thirds of the women secretaries of state are graduates of Wellesley. <laughs> When I took up choice, it's nice <laughs> class uh, When I took office, I was determined to do all that my predecessors had done, but I also felt an obligation to do something more. One of my goals was to make efforts to lift the lives of women and girls, part of the mainstream of U.S. foreign policy. So the first thing that I did was to assemble a club consisting of all the women foreign ministers. There were not many of us. We called ourselves the Fearsome 14, but we magnified our influence by agreeing always to take each other's phone calls. I'm very happy to see Anna Palacio, who we were not foreign ministers at the same time, but she is definitely part of that group. When some of the men complained about the fact that I took phone calls from Liechtenstein, uh, I told them that uh, there was a very simple solution to this. They could have themselves replaced by men. They, the men could have themselves replaced by women. During my years in office, our little club fought to establish a new concept of international security, one based not only on protection from missiles and bombs, but also from the chronic conditions that weaken societies from within. Everyone wants to be secure from military threats, but the perils that endanger most people in most places stem from other forms of insecurity a lack of food or water, the loss of arable land, the absence of economic opportunity, and the spread of disease. Insecurity stems as well from discrimination, including that based on gender. It's true that in recent years, women have made great strides in obtaining legal recognition of our rights. But often, even if the laws on the books are changed, the reality in some of the villages and communities has not. So appalling abuses are still being committed against women, and these include domestic violence, coerced abortions, ritual mutilations, dowry murders, <coughs> honor crimes, and even the killing of infants simply because they are female. Some say all this is cultural and there's nothing anybody can do about it. I say it's criminal, and we each have an obligation to stop it. a long way uh, in analyzing such issues as women in development, reproductive health, the psychology of social relationships, and the definition of equal opportunity in a world where women bear children and men do not. We have generated an impressive list of worthy objectives, including those set forth in the Beijing Platform for Action and the Millennium Development Goals. Our task looking ahead is not to spend more time refining this list, but to fulfill it. To that end, I suggest that we focus on the essential link that exists between women's rights and democracy. This connection should be obvious because democracy isn't viable in any country where half the population is held back or pushed down. In fact, women's empowerment may be the single most vital factor in determining whether a democratic government is able to meet the expectations of its people. As I've said many times, uh, for women to live without democracy is difficult, but for democracy to thrive without women is impossible. It's no accident that many of the countries that have historically lagged behind in living standards are those whose women remain an undervalued and underdeveloped resource. This doesn't mean that women in such countries have trouble finding work. On the contrary, they often do the vast majority of the work but don't own land, aren't taught to read, can't obtain credit, and don't get paid. And this matters because when women have the power to make their own economic and social choices, the chains of poverty can be broken, families are strengthened, the spread of sexually transmitted disease slows, and socially constructive values are more likely to be handed down to the young. One of the most exciting developments in recent decades has been the expanded participation of women in politics and government. And although I don't always see eye to eye with Margaret Thatcher, the truth is that history will thank her for demonstrating that a woman can be as tough and resolute as any man. Today, women heads of government are no longer a novelty. 
and neither are women cabinet ministers, legislators, judges, or generals. That is why one key test of the government starting to emerge in the Arab world is whether they will be more open to women's participation than their predecessors. It'll be good news indeed if women are able to have a prominent place in policy making as they've had in organizing protests, and if the belief that Arab women need to be protected is updated by the knowledge that when granted their rights, they can darn well take care of themselves. In saying this, I don't mean to imply that women in general make up a monolithic political force. Anyone who believes that we always agree with one another should try listening to me uh, and then to Sarah Palin. <laughs> but over time, women in government do make a difference because we are less content with the status quo, more adept at forming coalitions, more likely to denounce abuses of authority, and more liable to support investments that will strengthen society from the ground up. We believe, in short, that history can be pushed in a positive direction and that broader prosperity and more comprehensive security are within our grasp, provided we devote our energy and resources to the right goals. An example of this is the importance of ensuring that girls have access to education. In the past, the world was far more rural and agrarian. The traditional division of household responsibilities made greater sense. But we've moved into an age where mental agility is more important than muscularity. A girl might not be able to swing an ax as powerfully as her brother, but she can generate as much or more income through the creative use of her brain. And that's why any government that denies itself the intellectual and economic contribution of women and girls is not only going to be left behind, it is begging for a place on the revolutionary calendar headlined 2012. During my time as America's Secretary of State, I was privileged to represent my country in nations on every continent. I had many meetings uh, with high officials in fancy offices, but these were not the meetings that I remember the most. The people that I'll never forget are those I encountered in remote villages and rehabilitation centers in health clinics and safe havens for refugees. In Angola, I met with women who had to tie leashes to their children to keep them from wandering into minefields left over from their nation's civil war. In Sierra Leone, I spent time with a little girl who had lost her arm to a soldier's machete. In Thailand, with teenagers who were struggling to recover after having been kidnapped and trafficked for sex. In Rwanda and former Yugoslavia, I talked to families of those killed by ethnic cleansing and genocide. In Pakistan, I heard the testimony of girls who had been terrorized by the Taliban and of women who had been denied any rights at all except to remain silent, invisible, illiterate, and unemployed. Too often, women are forced to play the roles of victims, a role that we do not choose, but in the absence of power, are finding it hard to escape. The good news is that women's empowerment is gaining ground because many people in many countries have been unwilling to accept anything else. As democracy has spread, so has the message that equality is indispensable as a building block of social and economic progress. And where that message has taken hold, democracy itself has become stronger even in places where financial and other challenges remain. Since the Beijing conference 16 years ago, we have been building an action network that now stretches across every border, nation, race, background, and creed. Our goal is to give every girl and every woman the confidence that her life will be valued, her dignity honored, her rights respected, and her abilities recognized. A couple of months ago, I was honored to receive an invitation from President Obama to participate in a program recognizing International Women's Day. And the President and the First Lady were both there, and so the speakers were encouraged to be creative, not just to talk about the issues, but to do something artistic, like sing or dance. Uh, for me, this was a dangerous temptation, uh, which you will be relieved to know I resisted. Um, instead, I chose to read a poem about the importance of political organizing 
It is by Marge Piercy and seems an appropriate way to conclude my remarks today. The poem begins with a question. What can they do? Whatever they want. They can set you up, they can bust you, they can break your fingers, they can burn your brain with electricity. They can take your child, they can do anything you can't stop them from doing. How can you stop them? Alone you can fight, but they roll over you. But two people fighting, back to back, can cut through a mob. Two people can keep each other sane, can give support, conviction, love, hope. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can start an organization. With six, you can rent a whole house and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill a hall. A thousand have solidarity and your own newsletter. 10,000 <laughs> power and your own paper. A hundred thousand, your own media. 10 million, your own country. It goes on one at a time. It starts when you care to act. It starts when you do it again after they have said no. It starts when you say we and know who you mean. Each day you mean one more. As the poet's word remind us, progress in improving the lives of women and girls takes place step by step so that each victory becomes a platform upon which the next may be built. Our shared task is to keep building until we have raised enough platforms high enough to transform the very horizons of the earth. In that quest, we invite everyone to help us and caution that they cannot stop us. Thank you all very, very much. And I now look forward to responding to your questions. And since I'm no longer Secretary of State, I will actually be able to answer them. <laughs> My name is Kate Wojciechowski Grusing, and I'm a Wellesley 86. And I'm interested in your perspective on America wasn't ready for a woman president three years ago. Obviously, America has already begun its next election. Are you more or less optimistic that in your lifetime you'll see a female president? Hi, my name is Huria Ahmed. Um, it's such a pleasure to see you here, Ms. Albright. I'd like to ask you, what are your thoughts on the prospects for women and their possible participation within the new um, uh, democracies, possible democracies that we're seeing in the Arab, post-Arab spring regimes at the moment, in particular in Egypt? I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Albright, thank you very much. My name is Teddy Nicholson, a master's student in international relations here at LSC. Um, thank you for an inspiring speech. I just wanted to ask briefly uh, what your opinion is of the, uh, of the news the other day that Fatou Bensouda will be appointed as the first uh, female prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, um, especially given your involvement in the uh, drafting of the Rome Statute as Secretary of State. Thanks. So we have a, a lot of questions regarding possibility of a, of a female president in the United States, uh, women's participation particularly in Egypt, and then uh, women's leadership role in the ICC. 
Well, um, all very good questions. And let me just say this. Um, I am 74 years old, plan to live a lot longer, um, <laughs> and am an optimist. Um, so I do think that we will see a woman president. But I have to say that I would sometimes prefer a man with the right, with the correct, not the right thing. Uh, and then, um, <laughs> so I, I think that what I want is somebody who understands um, the role of government, that understands uh, social policy, that understands the need for a new social contract, and, but I hope very much to see a woman president uh, that went to Wellesley. <laughs> uh, and, and let me just say also, in terms of women's roles um, in um, Egypt and generally in the Arab world, the truth is I don't know. I think that some of the signs are not good. Uh, there is not a woman on the constitutional committee that was set up uh, in Egypt, though everything might in fact change as a result of this long 12-step process. Um, uh, and I think that it's something that needs to be pushed. The thing about what is happening, and let me just say this, in terms of what we call that's going on, we have called it the Arab Spring. It's now the winter. Um, I have called it the Arab Awakening, as have many others. There was an Arab, however, that I had a discussion with who said, what do you mean? Do you think we were all asleep all this time? And I said, so what do you call it? And he said, Arab troubles. And I said, well, what about calling it Arab opportunities? But it is a very long story, I think. And we have a tendency to look at it, uh, thanks to what I think has been not particularly good media coverage, as if it were some kind of a sports event. Um, uh, that is going to, it's all going to take a long time. And therefore, I think part of what has to happen here is support for women. Uh, in a variety of positions. As was mentioned, I'm chairman of the board of the National Democratic Institute. We have a whole program in terms of supporting women candidates. It's called Win With Women, and trying to see whether, in fact, there's a way to make uh, this happen everywhere. But at the moment, I think it's, it's an issue that has to be pushed. It's not an American story. It has to come from within. Um, on the International Criminal Court, I think I've met the new um, prosecutor, and I think that um, it's a very big step forward. I think that um, she's a, a remarkable person, um, and I think it's going to be very important. The question generally is how the ICC is regarded, um, and is it going to be able to live up to its potential? It, um, it was something that was very important when we were in office, and yet the United States is not a signatory, which is most unfortunate. Um, and the question is how, in fact, uh, we relate to what the ICC is doing, whether countries actually carry out um, the mandates or the, the sentences that have been, been imposed. But I think it's a very interesting and important step. <coughs> Hello, uh, my name is Ivana Kotasova. I'm a student here at LSE, and I also come from the Czech Republic, from Prague, so I really enjoyed your story Thank about you. the Blitz. Uh, I was wondering, you spoke about the time at Wellesley and about the time when you did not believe that a woman can become a Secretary of State or you know, get any high position. And I was wondering, what changed for you that you started believing in it? And how can we make other women on board stop thinking it's impossible and start believing in women can do it. Hello, Anissa Bouzian, Wellesley College, class of 87. Um, this year's Nobel Peace Prize laureates were all women. Um, would you please speak to us about what you believe the role of women in furthering peace, particularly in um, areas such as Liberia, um, what, what is specific about the role of women that makes that they have been able to do what maybe men might not have been able to do in the past? Just, just behind her. Thank you very much, Dr. Albright, for your, uh, for your remarks. My name is Gavin Charles. I'm a student here at LSE as well. Uh, and I was wondering if you could speak to the, the particular challenges that you faced as the first Secretary of State uh, who was a woman, uh, 
in particular in your travels to parts of the world where uh, that might have been seen as particularly surprising uh, to have the American top diplomat or diplomat in chief, so to speak, uh, being, being a woman? Thanks. Okay. Um, first of all, to uh, it's, uh, I, I think that what's interesting here is that I did not believe I'd ever be Secretary of State, even uh, when it came up. And I'll tell you the story, because what happened was I was ambassador to the United Nations. The president has a choice of what he does with that job as to whether it's a cabinet level job and a member of what is known as the principles committee, the decision making aspect. President Clinton decided to make it cabinet level, uh, which meant that I saw him frequently and in the principles committee. And also it was a time that, um, that we were very active at the UN. I was on television a lot and different things. And all of a sudden, my name started coming up as a potential Secretary of State. Um, and um, I didn't believe it. And um, in fact, what happened, and this was the hardest part, I was just talking to my daughter about this, is we were called in uh, towards the end of the first term and asked, what did you want to do in a second term? And I said, well, I was certainly prepared to stay at the United Nations. And then I actually got up the nerve to say that I would like to be Secretary of State. I can't believe I did <laughs> So then what happened was that my name kept being mentioned more and more. What did happen, somebody at the White House, I think, made a very bad mistake and said, yes, Madeleine Albright is on the list, but she's second tier. And that made a lot of people very angry. I kind of thought, well, that's part of the course. So um, what happened in uh, fall of 96, I get a phone call. Um, it, my name keeps coming up. They vetted me for part of it, but I still didn't believe anything was going to happen. And so uh, the first part of December, I get a phone call from Erskine Bowles, who was the chief of staff, and he said, I have two questions for you. If the president of the United States were to call you tomorrow morning, would you take the call? Like, <laughs> And if he were to ask you to be secretary of state, would you say yes? And I said, of course. And so he said, well, I was in New York. He said, go home to Washington, you'll get a call. So I go home, and then I forgot, in the morning I got up, forgot that I was dealing with President Clinton who didn't get up early in the morning, and I was afraid to even take a bath, and I sat there in my bathroom, and I kept thinking, he's changed his mind, he's changed his mind. So finally, they get on, uh, the phone rings, and they say, it's the White House calling, please hang on for the President. And then they put on some horrible music, and I kept thinking, he's changed his mind, he has changed his mind. And I did not believe it until I actually was standing in the Oval Office uh, when um, the announcement was made. It has something to do with the third question, and I'll get to the second one. And that is that um, mainly people were saying a woman could not be Secretary of State uh, in terms of dealing with Arab leaders. That was the question. So what happened was that the um, uh, Arab ambassadors at the UN got together and they said, we've had no problem dealing with Ambassador Albright. We will have no problems dealing with Secretary Albright. So that issue went away. The thing that I, and I went, I was named Secretary. I went on my first trip to um, deal with the Gulf Cooperation Council people. I did arrive in a very large plane that said United States of America <laughs> on it. And uh, I had a great meeting with the GCC ministers, and I said to them, you know, you've all been very kind to me, and perhaps you haven't noticed that I'm dressed differently than my predecessors, and this has been a great meeting, and next time we'll talk about women's rights. Um, so we did. I did not have a problem because I was the United States. I had more problems with the men in our own government. Uh, not because they were all male chauvinist pigs, but because <laughs> they, in fact, had watched me go through a very, very long process. Of, so I had been a carpool mother. I had been a friend of their wives. I had been a staffer on the Hill. I had made lots of coffee and did a lot of Xeroxing um, and had kind of gone up the, the line here. And they thought, well, how did she get to be Secretary of State when I should be Secretary of State? So that was an issue. And then the, then the question was, you know, how do I do the job? And 
part that's amazing now, as I, as I gave in my remarks, it's not a big deal. It is not a big deal. <laughs> and, um, and I think that ultimately the same thing will happen about president. But um, until you do it, I mean, I have to tell you, my portrait did go up in the State Department. And it is pretty different from everybody else up there. And it, and I'm, you know, and I wasn't born in the United States. I'm very proud to be an American, and I'm very proud that I will always be a piece of American history. So I'm, I'm thrilled about it. But I, I did have the nerve to say something, but it took me a long time, and, um, and I thought I couldn't do it. I really. Now to answer the third question is, I do think that women are good at. We are not as confrontational, though I have to say, this may surprise you and probably not appropriate at the moment, but I don't think the world would be entirely different if it were completely run by women. If only women were in charge, you've forgotten high school. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I think that uh, the mix is, is what is interesting. But what I do think is that we have a way of trying to build consensus and not being confrontational. And one of the things, for instance, um, what had happened on the Liberian issue, um, I, have, I know Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and the woman, the other woman who got it, she, we were on a panel together, and there's just a different approach in terms of trying to figure out how to get along. Uh, when I, I went, to, just to go back on Rwanda, the Hutu Tutsi issue, Burundi, as a reflection, is a mirror image of, of Rwanda. And I went there, and I got Hutu and Tutsi women together, and I said, look next door, see what happened. Uh, you all need to figure out how to uh, avoid this. And I think that there is the aspect of trying to, to build those kinds of relationships. Um, and I think it's a very important capability that we have that we need to work with. Sandra Shepping, wonderful talk, very inspiring. Um, you said that being a woman wasn't a problem in dealing with the Arab nations. Um, was, was, was being Jewish a problem? Hi, I'm Madeline Johnson, Wellesley class of 82. And um, I was delighted by your description of the coverage of the events in Egypt as um, a sports event. And I wonder if you'd like to comment about how this is, ch the media coverage or the role of the media has changed over the past um, since you've been in diplomacy and been involved in events like this. And if you can talk a little bit maybe about the future impact of some of these changes on world events such as the so-called Arab Spring. Lisa Berlinger, Wellesley College, class of 1990. Um, there's a special report this week in The Economist about women in work, saying how uh, women have made huge progress in the workforce, but nonetheless are still getting paid less than men and are still not in as many top jobs. One of the reasons, although not the exclusive reason, being that women are taking time off to have families and bearing children. How did you deal with the uh, competing demands of being a mother and the various projects that you did in addition to your work in the government, you did a lot of fundraising, you worked at Georgetown University, how did you do it? Uh, well, first of all, let me say, one, I didn't know I was Jewish, uh, and two, Henry Kissinger had been Secretary of State, so uh, not an issue. Uh, I think uh, also that um, in, in terms of trying to deal with the media question, there is no way to fully explain the role of 24-7 media in terms of foreign policy. Uh, it is um, very different. Uh, one of the things I tell my students, for instance, is I had been reading David McCullough's book on John Adams, who went off for two years and did a lot of negotiating and came back and <clears throat> tried to get agreements and nobody heard from him. I know that there are many ambassadors now who wish that were so, <laughs> but the bottom line is, is that there is a constant flow of information going back and forth. Um, and it has changed the decision-making process in many different ways because it requires you to react to something very quickly. And one of the hardest parts when you're in government is when they stick a microphone in front of you and say, what do you think about X has just happened? 
can't verify completely. And, and one of the rules out there is the first information is always wrong. So it creates a very difficult kind of decision making process. I think the other part that has happened is that there always have been um, information in terms of revolutions. That's part of, of what has happened. I wrote my <clears throat> dissertation on the role of the Czechoslovak press in 1968, and I wrote a book on the Polish press during the Solidarity period. And so information has been out there. And in Poland, for instance, Lech Wałęsa would speak somewhere, it would be on a cassette, it would be transmitted to another factory, and it would create a much larger sense. So all the different social media that's been taking place now is just a new level of all of this. The thing that I find troubling is the coverage that happened on um, what was happening primarily in Egypt, where Anderson Cooper thought he was a rebel and uh, was covering it in a way, and, and I always hesitate as a woman, this woman, using sports analogies, but it was like a game that had uh, a set period of time and maybe a little bit of overtime, um, and yet it, well, it's really a marathon. I think, and it has, was not covered in that particular way. And what has happened is that it has created a sense of why isn't this resolved yet? Uh, some to do with the question you asked about women. You know, why hasn't this been dealt with when after all 14 days and they were out of office? And so it creates an expectation uh, that everything has to be done uh, immediately. And I think that that is, that is a genuine issue and a problem in, in terms of the way that it has been done. I'm just reminded that today I was watching the BBC News and <clears throat> Angela Merkel gave a speech in which she basically pleaded for time and said this is a long-term problem we have to deal with and um, you know, stop describing every summit as a you know, do or die. And the last <laughs> sentence of the report was there is a make or break summit <laughs> 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 next week. <laughs> <laughs> well, she just, she just asked, no. not to say make or break. <laughs> but, there no. you go. But, it, but there is this kind of expectation that's set up and I have to say I mean, I, I consider myself relatively intelligent, but I can't watch when it says breaking news, and then it, there's a subscript thing, and the flag's waving, and somebody talking at me. It's just too hard to absorb. And then you have to watch the other channel, whichever it is, to try to figure out what the truth really is. <laughs> Part of the issue that is going on at the moment is that, just to take this question a little bit further, is in the United States, primarily, there is not a single source when I was growing up, we basically watched the network news. And there were three networks, and um, there was a general kind of um, common ground to what was going on. Now what people do is watch or listen to what they already agree with that really solidifies what they think. Now, I try very hard. I actually listen to Rush Limbaugh um, as I drive which is a dangerous activity. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think it's really important to try to figure out what the other people are saying. So, yeah. so, uh, did we get family and how you balanced? Oh, yes. Uh, well, let me just say, one of the things that is different is, as I said, I got married three days after I graduated from college. I had, in fact, um, my, my the first job, I thought I'd be a journalist, and I, um, did, I was married to a journalist, and what happened was that uh, I uh, had done what you're supposed to do is work on a small paper, and then we back, went back to Chicago. We were having dinner with his managing editor, and he said, so what are you gonna do, honey? And I said, I'm gonna work on a newspaper, and he said, I don't think so. Uh, you can't work on the same paper as your husband because of guild regulations, uh, and you wouldn't wanna compete with him, right? There were three other papers, and instead of saying what I might say today, I agreed. Um, ultimate, I had uh, all of a sudden, not so all of a sudden, but two years later, I had twins. And um, I had actually, I'm sorry to say, not wanted to go to graduate school, uh, having felt that I had a great education at Wellesley. Um, and I had wanted to take Russian at Wellesley, but because I'm Czech, I thought it would be too easy to take first year Russian, and I couldn't take second year Russian because I didn't know the alphabet. Um, and so my twins were born early, and I had to leave them in a hospital, and they were offering a Russian course for eight hours a day for six weeks um, on Long Island, and I took it, and it made me want to go back to graduate school. And 
what happened is I think graduate school and being a mother actually works together pretty well. In my case, what happened, it took me so long to get my PhD. I started, uh, I went to science for a while and then transferred to Columbia, and um, I uh, kept getting pregnant to get extensions, which is not a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, uh, and, uh, but ultimately my twins, they were in junior high and I still hadn't finished and they finally said, Mom, if you can't finish your paper, we're not going to finish ours. <laughs> uh, but what happened was that I was involved in a lot of volunteer work and a lot of different things. And when I ultimately went to work for Senator Muskie, my youngest daughter was seven and I said, do you mind? And she said, no, but at least I will know where you are. Um, and I had made a rule that I would always take phone calls from my children. And Everybody in the office knew it, but I have to tell the story because one time Katie called and I couldn't take the call and they told her that I was on the floor with Senator Muskie. <laughs> <laughs> and so I came home and said, what were you doing on the floor? <laughs> but um, I do not think it is easy to balance. And I think the mistake is, I have three daughters, and I think the mistake is if you think it's easy, it's not. And so it's a matter, I believe that women can do everything, but not all at the same time. And part of the thing is that our lives in many ways come in segments due to biology, and we should take advantage of it. And because I have found that many men actually get bored with the kinds of things they're doing, would like to switch what they're doing, and don't have a legitimate excuse. And, and I think that there's a way for women to be able to balance, but it's not easy. And every woman's middle name is guilt. Uh, because if you are uh, at home with your children, you think, did I go to Wellesley to do this? Uh, or if you are at work, then you think, why am I not at home with my children? And the worst part, I have to tell you, is other women, because we are very judgmental about each other. Mm -hmm. And what happened to me was when I was doing what I was doing, other women would say, don't you miss being in the carpool line? Uh, you are missing the best time of your children. And so. I think women have to not be judgmental about each other's choices. Choice is my word for everything to do with women. And, and I really do think, and for me, women have to help each other. And my saying is that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. <laughs>
on the empathy question. In some ways, I think there was kind of, I mean, having now seen what happened, is trying to figure out what, you know, give a helicopter and various things that happened and whether it would succeed. And I think it was a very natural thing for her to do. Um, but maybe the way the commentary was, there's an awful lot of stereotyping that goes on. There's no question about it. And um, uh, President Bottomley and I just did an interview in which we were mostly asked about uh, things to do with what kind of, why the, their commentaries about what women wear and they're not about men or you know what somebody looks like. And, and there is a certain amount of that because there still is this issue about how did she get there and what is, what is she doing. So um, on the empathy, let me do that. And then I, I think that um, one of the aspects of what I think makes a successful diplomat of um, either gender is that um, you are able to put yourself into the other person's shoes. That is the only way to be a good negotiator. Um, and otherwise, you don't understand what the potentials of compromise are which, by the way, has been forgotten in Washington. Uh, and part of it is being able to have some empathy for what is going on. I do think that um, I have to say that the various conditions that I saw, I, I have thought about this so much, is we are all exactly the same. Wherever I've gone, I've always felt that. And I know that I don't like to be hot or have bugs in my eyes or be hungry or not be able to go to the bathroom or whatever. And you're somewhere and you think, how would I be able to do this? How could I possibly do this? How could I live in this particular way? How could I walk that miles with something with water on my head or whatever? And the bottom line is that I think that empathy is a very important part of this. Um, and, and I do think, and again, it might go with putting the hand over the mouth, is because you understand what, what you're seeing. And if you don't understand it, um, then you shouldn't be in that line of work. So I, I do think it's important. It, it is not feeling sorry for people, uh, but understanding what they're going through in order to try to figure out how to fix it. Uh, that's the, the reason to do it. The Syria issue, um, let me say, I, I just, uh, one of the hardest parts about being a foreign policy, in foreign policy at all, and especially in being a decision maker, is how you manage to balance what is kind of the overall view of where your policy should go uh, in terms of your views, ideals, and principles. And at the same time, having the capability and the information to distinguish one situation from another. And the hardest part to tell students, and I do this with mine, is that we're, foreign policy is not consistent. It is not. You have to choose different things for different situations and analyze what the issues are, what the pros and cons of actions are, what are the unintended consequences of the decisions that you uh, either have made or have refused to make. And so the hard part is trying to separate one issue from another. I think Syria is an unbelievably complicated issue in terms of being a country that um, has so many different sectarian aspects to it, kind of a, a mixing bowl of various issues in the, in the Middle East of having um, a variety of different uh, groups within it. Um, also, the danger of it spreading in a variety of ways and um, that the difficulty of trying to sort out who can act. And I have found, for instance, that uh, one of the things that needs to happen is to think about it in terms of a regional context uh, of whether there are other countries that can be helpful. I've just come from Turkey. I find Turkey one of the most interesting countries at the moment. And they are taking a fairly active view in terms of well, some of the things that can be done in Syria. Just because we did something in Libya doesn't mean that we can do exactly the same thing in Syria. But the main thing, and I speak for nobody but myself, is that um, even though the idea is that we, we cannot allow, I mean, everybody who said Assad has to go, the question is what are the tools? I, I say, in my, I teach a course, I say foreign policy is just trying to get some other country to do what you want. That's all it is. Uh, the bottom line is what are the tools? So the course I teach is the National Security Toolbox. 
Um, and there are different tools, and there are diplomacy, and there's the economic tools, and the use of force, and intelligence, and law enforcement. And it's interesting to watch um, how the toolbox is being used by the U.S. and the, and the countries in the region. I was just on the stereotyping. I was reminded um, uh, in an area that I studied, the European Union, uh, how the high representative of the EU, Catherine Ashton, has had such a lot of pride uh, in the press. Um, and a lot of it has been quite a lot of gender stereotyping, yeah. uh, again, including sort of what she wears and right. how she wears her hair and, and the, whole, the whole rest of it. Right, um, right at the back, there's a lady with a scarf. Hi, my name is Kelly Nielsen-Peterson. I'm from the class of 76 at Wellesley. I wanted to look a little more east at China. Um, uh, China is buying up all the mines in Africa, and they're giving loans to European countries now and buying US bonds. Do you think we're going to see? We used to be told that when um, uh, the standard of living increased in China, then we would get democracy in China. But I don't really see it going that way. What do you think? Thank you, Annie Bird, International Relations, PhD, LSE. To what extent do you think your focus on accountability in the 1990s has transformed global interest in transitional justice? Thank you. Katrin Masajda, Brunel Business School. Um, thank you for an interesting talk. I have a question related to the use of strategies to increase the share of women in senior positions both in politics as well as in other areas of society. And a lot of co uh, countries have quotas in politics, and currently there's a debate about using quotas in terms of private sector and the corporate boards. Do you think that there's a need for quotas to change the image of a leader as a man, both in, po both in politics as well in, as in the private sector? Those three questions definitely don't go together. Uh, so, um, on China, um, I have spent a lot of time in China um, and also dealing with a variety of, of Chinese. I also have the belief that as you create a middle class, you, are, you do create people who want to make decisions about their own lives and moving in some way towards more involvement of people within the decision making process. What is happening in China is we've talked about a little bit as a society of this, they are, um, consumers, but not necessarily citizens, uh, and um, a society of the satisfied. And the question is, what happens in China uh, when there are more and more people, I mean, they have brought the equivalent of the American population out of poverty, but there's still an awful lot of people in poverty. And the divisions in China are there um, very visible uh, to them more and more. I am involved in a very peculiar dialogue with, where Democratic and Republican political people are having a dialogue with the International Department of the Communist Party. Uh, and the question is, the Chinese are interested in having this dialogue, and the question is why? And some of it, I think, has to do with the fact that there is pressure at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, and as information is getting into China, um, and there are issues on environmental aspects and on the division urban-rural divisions in a variety of different ways. They're trying to figure out basically what their legitimacy is. Marxism is not their legitimating theory. And so they are looking at um, Confucianism or nationalism. Um, and they are obviously energy hungry and they're everywhere. But I do think that um, I ultimately think that they will not be able to maintain an authoritarian government and have a market economy uh, permanently, they just don't go together. Um, and the question is the timing. What is interesting is that every time anybody talks about China, it's rising. Um, and yet, and we were talking about this earlier, they are dependent on selling whatever it is that they make. And the extent to which there are economic problems in other part of the world, their growth is also affected by it, which ultimately is a question as to how they continue to please the, the what we call the satisfied in China that have gotten a benefit out of it and then still deal with these huge numbers uh, that are not um, empowered in any way. But it's, it's a fascinating country to watch and I just happen to believe that ultimately they are going um, in, the, in the direction where they won't be able to avoid the fact that more people want to have a say in what they're doing. They actually are things going on at the lower level. 
terms of some municipal elections and various things that show a certain amount of desire to get people involved. And, and I'm about to, we're about to have a dialogue next week with them again. Um, and the question is why, they, why they're doing this. It is one of my issues to try to sort out. On the accountability, um, I think that the thing that I found very interesting, one of the folks that I'm proudest of when I was at the United Nations was creating the war crimes tribunals. And um, the question was, people want to know why we were doing that. And some of it had to do with, since terrible things were happening in the Balkans, of how to ultimately make it possible for to assign individual guilt so the collective guilt didn't have to be there. And so I think they've played a very important role because you can't just decide that the whole society um, is responsible for something. And I think that accountability in the international system is very important. It goes on to the ICC question. It, it's very, it's a new concept. It's difficult to kind of see an international legal system uh, but I think it's very important to try to work out the precedent on it. The U.S., which as we said is not a part of this, has begun to look at some of the precedent that has been set by the ICC and the war crimes tribunals and the way that they've operated. But it, it's difficult to make it happen. I think one of the hardest parts is what does it mean when you say international community? Uh, you and I were talking about genocide prevention. I uh, am um, we're hitting a task force now on um, the concept of responsibility to protect. Uh, that is an accountability issue in many different ways. If the sovereign is not taking care of his or her people, then does the international community have some right, and not right, but responsibility to go in there, and it bumps up against national sovereignty and the issue of accountability nationally and, and internationally, I, I think, in different ways. Quotas. Quotas, first of all, I do think more women should be a part of every system. Americans don't really like quotas. Um, and there's kind of this sense of uh, why do you need a quota? Um, on the other hand, if you look at some of the Scandinavian countries, there have been more women involved in a variety of ways. I, I personally don't like them. But, um, but I do want to see more women elected. And so I think that what has to happen is to try to figure out ways to empower women in other ways. And, but there's something that Americans don't like about just the word quota. Um, and, and then the other part, uh, President Bottomley and I were talking about this. I am very proud to have been the first woman Secretary of State. But I wanted to be Secretary of State because I was going to be a good Secretary of State not because I was a woman. So I think that there's a way, I don't know exactly how one frames that, but I, I don't think that you just want to be chosen. Um, on the other hand, women need to be a part of the system for the, some of the things that we were talking about, which is the kind of values that we bring, the experiences that we have, maybe more empathy, um, that is a part of the system, aside from the fact that it's plain stupid not to use more than half the population uh, in terms of economic and political empowerment. It robs the country of stability and some of the points that I made. Hi, uh, my name is Katie Rowley and I am a master's student here in the, GI, uh, the Gender Institute at LSE and I also recently graduated from college in May. And my question um, for you is what your thoughts are on what seems to be um, a discomfort or a level of uncomfort with feminism in my generation, um, and just what your thoughts are on that in general, and then what advice you would give uh, those of us who aren't uncomfortable with it, um, trying to convince our peers that feminism is not a dirty word anymore. Hi, my name is Caitlin Wilkins, class of 2003 from Wellesley. Um, I a follow-up question to your comments on media. Um, social media has obviously played a large role in many of the political events happening recently around the world. Um, Middle East to Colombia to the United States and the election of Barack Obama, some might argue. Lots has been written about the positives of social media and the power of the internet. And I'm curious if you feel that there are any um, unique challenges or even negatives for policymakers, foreign ministers, and other uh, people in those positions uh, poised by social media. 
Thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Albrecht. My name is Ani Darbinian, and I'm originally from Armenia and uh, have lived in the US and um, feel proud to be a citizen of the US now. And uh, having lived there for 10 years, I've fought um, with the Armenian diaspora in the recognition of the Armenian genocide. And um, I guess my, uh, until today, uh, we have, we're fighting for that. And my question, I guess, as a young uh, professional going into the world, and uh, trying to have uh, impact uh, and being too ambitious uh, and trying to help my country, which is small in scale compared to the US, is it uh, better to lend a helping hand by working in the US like you have done and lend a helping hand to my native country? I guess that's my question. Okay. Um, maybe I should ask you, what is the pro what, why, don't, why doesn't your generation is that a lot of them think that um, we don't need it anymore. And um, also, <laughs> um, there's also, I actually had a conversation with a friend a couple weeks ago and they, she told me that she and her friends don't um, identify as feminists because um, they, they don't see any point in doing it anymore and they feel like it would make other people uncomfortable if they told them that they were feminist. <coughs> Um, but, but let me say this. I think that um, one of the things, first of all, uh, I, I really am tired of women feeling like victims. I mean, I think that um, we have accomplished a lot and uh, we should be proud. And, and there are a lot of men in this audience who I think have figured out they can work with women and actually get something done. Um, however, I do think there's the following point, is that nothing is ever a done deal. And I think that maybe some of the women your age don't understand how hard this has been. Um, there, it was the 50th anniversary of Ms. Magazine, and uh, it was interesting because Gloria Steinem, kind of feminist incarnate, um, was explaining how hard it was at the time to even think about having a magazine that was devoted to women's issues. And, and the truth is that um, there are many people, I happen to, and I mentioned this earlier, I, I do think that um, there are different audiences. I just had a very interesting discussion in Washington with people that are older people that have gone back to school, that clearly have jobs and find it very hard uh, to get an education. And I'm still of the kind of uh, mind where I think that some women don't want to work and uh, want to stay at home with their kids. The bottom line is a lot of women have to work and are not, and it has to do with how much uh, people are paid and properly, and the women are still not being paid the same for as men are for the same job. And so part of the thing is it's so easy to go backward. It really is. And, um, and I don't want to sound like, you know, I've, I've had a great time and I've been very lucky. I really have been very lucky in terms of being in the right place at the right time with the right credentials. But um, the bottom line is, is that um, there are injustices going on even in this country and, and I think there's nothing wrong with being a feminist. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, and, and, and it's never quite over. Um, and, and I think that you will find as you get into the workplace that it's not simple. Um, and that's why you need other women. That's my saying about a special place in hell. So I, I think that, that that is part of, of what is going on because it took a long time to get where we were, are, and it can go back very easily um, because of a lot of ideological things that are going on. So that, that would be my answer to that. The social media is, as I said earlier, really hard to deal with because you don't quite know where it's coming from, what the sources are, um, and um, whether the information that's coming out is accurate information. On the other hand, what I find so interesting, and to go back, I mean, what I had, my academic life, has really been looking at the role of information in political change. 
And one of the things that happens in authoritarian states is that the channel is all top down and there are no horizontal, the attempt is always, and this goes to the China issue, the attempt is to stop all horizontal communication uh, because the state controls what goes top down. And so the social media has created that horizontal communication and linked people that might in other ways not know what is going on among others. And clearly what happened in the Arab world has been viral in many different ways. And some of the information in the, in the horizontal channels that are accurate, some are not, but it's not easy for decision makers to deal with. There's no question about that. It is hard um, when you don't know where the information is coming from. On the other hand, it's very democratic, small d, in terms of the way that information um, is shared. Um, I have to tell you, um, I, I, on the Armenia question, or generally the role of the diaspora in any society, um, I think that um, it is always, I mean, I, I was born in Czechoslovakia and I've lived my life in the United States. I think that in a, a variety of ways, uh, my very good friend, Czech ambassador to the United Kingdom is here, and we had uh, we met each other in the 1980s, um, um, and we have worked together on many things, and we've had this discussion. Uh, and I've had this discussion with President Havel, who stayed in Czechoslovakia, uh, and who is one of the great moral leaders of our time. And I believe that I actually did what I could to help the country where I was born by being in the States and helping in a number of different ways. But it is, a, it is an issue as to what people do and whether it's the right thing to go back to the country where you came from and to use the talents that you have to help the people uh, where you were born. But, and it's a very personal and very difficult <coughs> question to answer. Uh, and um, on the other hand, I, you know, other people have to answer this for me, which is that um, I talked a lot about place where I was born and tried to do what I could to help. On the other hand, if everybody, that and I think there are probably a number of foreign students here, only stay in the United Kingdom or the United States, then a lot of the talents that you have developed are not used on behalf of, of the country where you were born that needs a lot of help and affection. We'll do one more, one more round. All right, here in the front <coughs> Hi, my name is Dan Meiji. I'm a master's student here at LSE. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you think uh, the role of sanctions really should be. You know, a lot of people say that leadership in countries that get sanctioned are so insulated already that they don't really affect them, that they kind of hurt the poor populations. And you just talked a lot about information and how important that was in the Middle East. This new round of sanctions in Iran, a lot of people are saying, well, this actually could really damage the, the future of the movement because you're going to prohibit some of the important technology from getting in there. Um, hi, uh, thank you for your insight, insightful talk, uh, Dr. Albright. Um, I'm um, Anum Yusuf, and I'm a Pakistani student here at the LSE. Uh, just curious to ask for your view on the latest NATO attack on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border um, and its effect on the PAC-US relations in the future. Thank you. Now that you know more the Secretary of State, you can talk about <laughs> more. <laughs> Hello, my name is Lee hyun from I'm Korean from Tokyo, Japan. Um, and then I used to work at the American Embassy in Tokyo as well, uh, political section, and it's so inspiring to uh, see the woman like yourself. Um, anyway, my question is, back in 2000, you visited Pyongyang and met the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-il. I think you're the highest Western diplomat diplomats ever to meet Kim, Kim Jong-il in person. Um, I was just wondering, what was your uh, impression of him as a person? Because he's like really <laughs> betrayed as a venice and devil. And what is your gut feeling the country's going? Do you think North Korea as well can go head towards democracy like China? So, you know, if you can tell me about that. Thank you. So, so I have to tell you, whenever any of you are asked to do your comprehensives, just remember what I've been through up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, on the role of sanctions, let me just say this. Um, 
I told you about my course. The way that my course came about was I was in the Carter administration during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And uh, we had an interagency meeting. We're trying to figure out how to punish the Soviets for what they had done. We knew that we couldn't push them out right away, but how to punish them. And we had a meeting. It was really the craziest thing, where every department put something on the table and said, well, we'll <laughs> won't allow them fishing rights, or there was the grain embargo, and not sending our uh, athletes to Moscow. And it made me realize, here we were, the most powerful country in the world, with this toolbox, which actually there's not a lot in it. Um, and what happened was that, uh, so I teach a lot about sanctions, and my job when um, I was first named to the United Nations was that the Gulf War ceasefire had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions that kept coming up, uh, seriatim for um, uh, re-mandating. And my, I was an instructed ambassador, and my assignment was to make sure that those sanctions stayed on. Um, and and I'll just tell you a quick story. What happened was, so I had to, I was supposed to say terrible things about Saddam Hussein constantly which he deserved. He'd invaded another country. So um, what happened was that um, finally a poem appeared in the papers in Baghdad that compared me to many things, but among them an unparalleled serpent. Um, and I happened to have a snake pin. This is how the whole pin business started. Um, and so when we were dealing with Iraq, I wore my snake pin. And they said, why are you doing that? And I said, because I was called an unparalleled serpent. And so that's, that was how that began. But the bottom line is it taught me a lot about sanctions. And uh, we saw that when you put complete sanctions on a country, what it does, one of the mistakes that people make is to think that total sanctions include food and medicine. They do not. Uh, whenever we put total sanctions on, it does not do that. But having complete sanctions is pretty much of a blunt instrument. And so towards the end of the Clinton administration, we began to look at what are called now targeted sanctions, we called smart sanctions, that were a way of, of making clear that the people that were really responsible were the ones that were targeted. So in um, Serbia, Milosevic and his crew, and. Um, and it seemed like a smarter, a more surgical way to use the sanctions. The thing is, in many ways, when you look in the toolbox, it's the tool of choice because it is tougher than diplomacy and not as bad as the use of force. And if you've got to do something, that's why you pick the sanctions tool. And trying to isolate what is going around, it, uh, what is happening now because of the IAEA report and the nuclear issue, is there not a lot of options here. And part of the thing is, how do you get control over the money uh, that is going into the nuclear program? And the question is how to target it enough. And the technology is a problem, frankly. One of the hardest part on sanctions is trying to decide what is dual use. Um, and when we were dealing with Iraq, you know, obviously uh, weapons are, is fertilizer dual use? Our boots dual use, our trucks dual use, and so it gets very hard in terms of determining it. But I think that you have to look at it in terms of what are the tools that the international community has at all, and that's why the sanctions tool uh, is chosen. That that is, and you do try now. I think we've learned enough to target it so that it theoretically affects only a small part of the population. On Pakistan, I think that. Um, on any given day, um, there are an awful lot of issues that the Secretary of State and the President, Secretary of Defense have to deal with. And without insulting you, I think that Pakistan has everything that gives you an international migraine. Um, it has um, nuclear weapons, terrorists, poverty, corruption, a weak government, and it's in a terrible location. Um, and um, so it is very difficult. We also have had a very up and down relationship with Pakistan. Some, and it goes to the sanctions issue, uh, because uh, often Congress puts the sanctions on and they're automatic. Um, when there is development of a nuclear potential, the Pressler Amendment kicks in, or when there's a coup by Musharraf, a variety of, uh, another set of sanctions kicks in. And it makes for a very up and down relationship with Pakistan, who I think rightfully has called us a fair weather friend. Um, 
And it's a very complicated relationship. It's complicated in terms of whether you deal with the civilians or the military, what the relationship of the military and the ISI is very difficult. I don't know what happened with the NATO thing. I think that there is an investigation going on. Clearly, there is a problem in terms of what is happening um, in, the North, in the territories and Fatah, generally misunderstandings about what is what. In addition, and I think this is the most serious thing, there is an erosion of trust <coughs> that um, either developed over the hand-holding incident in the uh, killing uh, of Osama bin Laden, who, by the way, is still dead. Uh, <laughs> and, um, I think that there's an issue about who trusts whom and what, but it is an incredibly difficult issue. I also, I don't know what the answer is. I really don't. But I do think that it also politically, in some ways, serves a purpose to be anti-American to certain people. Um, and, and I think it's a very, very difficult uh, uh, relationship, probably the most difficult one that is out there. And we need each other. And, and that's the part that makes it difficult. So a good way to end is with Kim Chung-il. <laughs> Understandings and a lot of bad timing in terms of, uh, and the uh, agreed framework was put into place. Um, and I have to say that the deal was that the um, United States, South Korea, and Japan would help to put, provide money and or build the light water reactors and provide heavy fuel. Um, for reasons that had to do with funding, etc., cetera, um, there was a delay in a lot of the aspects of the agreed framework, and so the, I hold no brief for the North Koreans, but I can see that there was an issue, and the relationship got worse and worse. Then uh, President Clinton called for review of our North Korean policy. Former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry headed that up, and basically said to them, there's a fork in the road moment here. You can either negotiate, uh, and we can look at a variety of issues, or we are going into a worse and worse confrontational issue. A war would be terrible, millions of people would die, uh, but the choice is yours here. And they chose to negotiate. So what happened was that Vice Marshal Cho, the number two, came to the United States. Uh, he came to my office, it was interesting, he arrived in a, a pinstripe suit and was very diplomatic. And then we went to the Oval Office and he changed into his uniform with many medals for killing Americans. And, uh, and what he did was issue an invitation to President Clinton to come to North Korea. And President Clinton said, well, you know, maybe at some point I'll go, but I can't just go. It, this has to be prepared. And so I'm sending the Secretary of State. They were not real happy about that. Um, and we had no embassy in North Korea, so we had no idea what was going to happen. And the information that our intelligence agency had was that Kim Jong-il was crazy and a pervert. <laughs> he is not crazy. And so, <laughs> so what happened was I get there and I had absolutely no idea what was going to happen. And so I go to the guest house where they put you, where they are watching you, and they also can tell even what you're typing on your computer. And you're kind of, you know, Really, you just have to write notes to each other. And so we sat there, and I had no idea what was going to happen. So all of a sudden, I get a message saying that I had to go and see his embalmed father. So I went <laughs> to pay my respects to Kim il uh, And I get back, and they say, OK, now the dear leader will see you. And so we have our first press conference. And uh, I'm standing there, and um, it was really weird, something out of the 50s with old cameras and things, and I'm standing there and I look and I see we're the same height. And I had on high heels, so I look at him and he had on high heels. <laughs> and his hair was a lot poofier than mine. But then we started talking. We went into a room and um, he was very, very smart, I, I found. And he did 
not consult his advisors as we began to talk about missile limits and a variety of, of different uh, discussions. And, and he really was um, very communicative. And then he said, well, we'll continue our discussions tomorrow, but I have a surprise for you tonight. And so he took me, he said, we are redoing our celebration for the 50th anniversary of the Workers' Party. We went into, there was, Pyongyang is actually a very attractive city with no electricity. Uh, but all of a sudden we arrive in this stadium where there must have been 100,000 people all clapping in unison. Um, and then they had um, the show and they, you know, the flashcards that people use at football games. They were able to do kind of tableaus of the deer leader in the fields with a tractor. And um, then all of a sudden they did something quite brilliant, which was there was a picture of a missile, uh, a typo dong, and he made it, the, 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 whoever the performers were, were good enough at the flashcards that the missile took off. And he turned to me and he said, that's the last one. Um, and then there were people, they had gymnasts in incredible, I mean, you have to realize this is all in complete poverty. I had watched a, uh, uh, a, a documentary flying in of people eating bark off the trees and various things while this is going on. Tons of money spent on this performance in great costumes. We then went and had a fancy dinner with French wine and um, and he knew everything about all our movies and Oscar picks and, and everything. He, I also, I knew that he liked Michael Jordan, so I brought a basketball for him autograph. But the interesting, then he says to me, so I'm really considering the Swedish model, and I thought, <laughs> which kind of model is he talking about? <laughs> and then what he said was, so let me ask you, how does my interpreter compared to Kim Dae-jung's. All this through the interpreter. And I thought, I'm gonna get this person killed. So um, I said what was absolutely true, that Kim Dae-jung had the best woman interpreter anywhere in the world, but you have a great interpreter too. And he said, well, I wanna have Korean Americans come and teach us English. The bottom line is, is that what, what we did was, uh, there were follow-on talks. Um, I had actually signed an agreement with Vice Marshal Cho saying that we had no hostile intent. Um, and there were talks going on. President, we were running to the end of President Clinton's term. Um, and we had actually, most people don't know this, invited Kim Jong-il to come to the United States. And because he doesn't like to fly, he didn't come. And then there was the election of 2000. There were many Americans that were confused about the election of 2000. Um, clearly, Kim Jong-il was confused about it. Uh, and one of the things that happened was that um, when we briefed Secretary Powell and Dr. Rice about what we had arrived at, Secretary Powell wanted to continue. The Washington Post ran a headline that said, Powell to continue Clinton policies. Secretary Powell was then asked to come to the White House, and the policy changed. So I think that terrible mistakes were made on this. Uh, and what Kim Jong-il and the North Koreans want more than anything else is recognition by the United States. And the question is where the six-party talks can go. I think that um, it is a dangerous situation. Uh, and I hope that the six-party talks are continued and that the Chinese play a positive role in it.